Coming up on this edition of the EV Revolution Show, give you an update about what's going on at Sono Motors, talk about some battery prices, what's going on there, uh, manufacturer news, and more. Coming right up. Well, hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Wilcore, your host for episode 71. As I'm moving along here, getting close to the holiday season, hope everybody's uh, getting excited about the holidays coming up. I know here in the Northeast, we're getting good amounts of snow or a little earlier than we're expecting, but I appreciate you taking the time to watch uh, the channel. Before I start with the news, I just want to start with a quick correction from my last uh, broadcast, the last show where I, where I did the part two about the Cybertruck. I did a comparison with the Tri-Motor Cybertruck to the Rivian R1T, and I got a few comments back saying that my, com my comparison was not 100% correct because I was comparing a model that would cost much more than what the Cybertruck would at 69.9. And that is correct because I pulled the info from the Rivian website and um, didn't account for the different they don't have any other published pricing right now on their trim levels and um, I did compare it now spec again there are lots of different specs as, as I talked about so I'm not going to go through that again but I do thanks ev uh, everybody who commented on there again there were some heated comments <laughs> I think some folks still didn't kind of quite see where I was coming from I'm very positive on Tesla as everybody knows if you've been watching my shows for even b before in the Model 3 clubs you will know that I'm, I have a soft spot for Tesla there's no problem there but I do like to call things as I see it and provide opinions and that these are my opinions just to give you something to reflect on more than capable to dis, uh, disagree and that's the beauty of our democracy is that we can agree to disagree so again thanks everybody for chiming in all right, let's, so let's get into the new segment here. First story I'm covering is, uh, you know, I talk, talked a lot and I continue to talk a lot about cost parity and when we're going to achieve that. I still think it's five to seven years or five to six years now out. And this is an article that I picked up that, that has said that battery prices have fallen 87 percent since 2010, excuse me, um, in uh, in this current year. So that's a, that's a huge amount. I'm, I'm, if I recall in 2010, uh, pack pricing was something like over a thousand dollars U.S. per kilowatt hour. Um, now they're down to one hundred and fifty-six dollars at the end of November of this year. This is according to a Bloomberg New Energy Finance report. Um, so that's eighty-nine percent, eighty-seven percent difference from the first from back in twenty ten. They predict that that one hundred dollar U.S. Uh, per kilowatt hour mark could be broken in four years by twenty twenty four, which would line up with my analysis of cost parity in about five, four, five to six years now. Um, they contribute the cost reductions to, of course, increasing volumes. As I keep saying, all, all these battery manufacturers are spinning up and, and, and you know, trying to manufacture more, building new plants, re all this kind of stuff. Um, of course, that's in combination with the growing market that is the battery electric vehicle and the electric vehicle marketplace. So sales are growing there, even though slower. And the growing spread of, ca spread of cathodes with higher energy densities over the last uh, nine years or so. Now, the future predicts that new battery pack designs and lower manufacturing costs are going to help further drive these prices down uh, in the next few years. Um, the, this marketplace is actually forecasted by 2030 to be about $116 billion annually. Uh, I believe this is a U.S. number, so you can convert that to whatever currency, but certainly a huge market as we know it's going to be. And it has to be to accommodate the number of EVs that we need to be selling out there to really make a difference in the transportation sector. Um, getting to that less than $100 U.S. per kilowatt hour in 2024, um, you know, it, it, it is something that would help uh, bring cost parity down and, and help with having uh, battery electric vehicles compete with internal combustion vehicles in the sales price, because we know that that's one of the major adoptions to EV, uh, to barriers, uh, to EV adoption is the pricing, obviously, and without incentives, it's, it can be hard to justify, even with operating costs and maintenance and lower, I get it, guys, but you still have to build out that ownership. And, you know, sometimes these prices can be 10, 15, 20, 25 thousand dollars more than a comparable ICE car, and that's a big chunk of money to spend. So, um, <clears throat> 
Electric vehicles themselves, of course, are important for lowering costs because manufacturers now are getting to these tailor-made EV platforms. So Tesla started it with their platform um, and everybody else is getting onto it, you know, looking at Volkswagen with the MEB platform, getting into these areas where you can manufacture dozens and dozens of vehicles on the same platform um, to help drive your cost down, your manufacturing cost down and reduce um, reduce those costs. So. Uh, after we hit um, $100, I mean, it, it, per kilowatt hour in the next four or five years, it does look promising. Um, it doesn't, you know, then the next step that people are talking about is to get to sub $100 range. And that could take longer. That could, that may not be achievable to the 2030 time frame. We'll just have to wait and see. There's a lot of uncertainty about that future um, of how it's going to go. But it is confirmed that in the second half of the, of the next decade, energy density at the cell and pack level will play a growing role as the materials and production ca uh, capacities are used more efficiently. And I talk about all this R&D that's going on, solid state, you name it, higher density, getting more bang for the buck in, in that same footprint, in that same physical space, uh, and that, that uh, science continues to move forward. So we shall see the technology change. But good news to see that, you know, to get some affirmation that prices have come down. I would love to see that being transposed, uh, transposed to you and the rest of the consumers out there in falling prices. We haven't seen that yet. But I'll continue to monitor and uh, hopefully we will start seeing those prices come down again within the next uh, five or six years, hopefully sooner. Now, I've talked a lot about municipalities and, and you know, the, the, um, the change that you can affect by starting local in your region, in your, in your town, in your city and whatever, wherever you live and trying to look at climate change action plans and transportation as a viable sector to help impact and help lessen uh, those mitigate those uh, those carbon footprints. Well, Los Angeles is taking a lead. They're looking to aim their electricity, um, uh, their carbon footprint to, and reduce everything by 25 percent. That's a big number for L.A. Remember, they're one of the biggest cities in North America, or at least in the U.S., um, and 25 percent is a significant number. They want to reduce that by 2028. They call it their Zero Emissions Roadmap 2028 2.0 plan. That's a mouthful. They want to get it done just in time before the Olympics. Um, and their plan is that they want to have 80% of uh, all new vehicles uh, sold in LA should be electric. Now, they're not, it doesn't sound like they're mandating any type of regulation or legislation on that, but they're going to be recommending quite strongly and, and probably looking at putting some incentives somehow to help spur those sales and spur that adoption. They're already, the city itself is aiming for an electric share of their fleets by 30 to 30% in that time frame, which is a big number. The Gain City has a lot of vehicles. Um, you know, LA, everybody knows LA for the traffic jams. I lived there for a couple of years, so I can certainly attest to that. Uh, they are known for the traffic jams. And, you know, the idea is to try to replace uh, single, you know, most of the cars are, are single occupancy. So trying to, and that's why HO, HOV lanes in LA are very, very like gold down there uh, because of that. Um, but also trying to strengthen other means of transport, including mass transit and, and, and promoting other methods. Lots of things that municipalities could do. Great to see LA well, I guess they have to, right? Everybody's familiar with LA smog at some point. So they've got to step out of that and look to, to a pretty uh, hard plan, uh, an aggressive plan to get them into uh, some reductions. And I'm glad to see this come from them. A couple of quick manufacturer news, uh, just Audi uh, or Audi, 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 whatever you want to call it. There's different ways to pronounce it. Um, they have come out and said that they're investing an additional 12 billion euros uh, for electric, uh, electricity, um, uh, electric mobility till 2024 in the next aggressive plans. They want to have 30 electrified models uh, on offer by 2025. So within five years, 20 of them to be full all electric vehicles. So that's pretty aggressive. Um, they're spending, as I mentioned, big money on this kind of stuff. 12 billion. The, they've already um, spent, uh, I think, a total of about 37 billion into R&D, as well as plant properties, equipments, uh, investments in, in increasing and retooling and all that good stuff. Now, this is part of VW Group's overall planning round 68 uh, concept that they've come out with, um, which uh, last month they decided to pump an additional 33 billion euros into their e-mobility um, plans uh, within the next four or five years. <clears throat> this will see the VW Group increase uh, their investments by 10% uh, over the next four years, uh, up to in upwards of 60 billion euros uh, on all kinds of things, not just electromobility, but hybrid as hybridization, as they say, that's a mouthful, and digitization as well. 
Uh, you can look up what those things mean for VW. So just good to see, again, money coming in. It does take time, folks, for the other manufacturers that haven't been building all electric vehicles for nine years like Tesla has in 10 years. They need this you know, to get into the game and spool up. And there's all this big infrastructure and mass um, uh, uh, processes and, and equipment and all the stuff that they need to get going to be able to start mass producing uh, all electric vehicles at quantities. And it's good to see Audi taking these steps. Now, now to compete with Audi, I guess the same week an announcement comes out from uh, Hyundai that they want to, uh, uh, they've come up with their electric strategy for the next five years and beyond. They want to become one of the three largest EV manufacturers in the world. That's a big statement. It's going to be a tall order to fill, and they're taking a multifaceted approach. They want to have annual sales of uh, 670,000 electric vehicles by 2025. Great. I love it. Again, we need millions and millions of these cars to be pumped out in order to take, to make a dent in that global car sales. 560 are to be all electric from uh, Hyundai. Uh, and 110,000 are to be fuel cell. So they are, again, taking that multifaceted. They are continuing to invest in fuel cell vehicles. I'm fine with fuel cell. There's markets for it. Uh, I like to see the advance of it because I, I, I do think that that is a very viable technology if we can get the pricing and the delivery and all the processing and all that stuff down to a consumer point. It's nowhere near mass market availability. I mean, 110,000 is globally is not a mass market. In my opinion, it's a very niche market, um, but it's, I'm glad that they're continuing to invest as, as other like Honda and other manufacturers are. So let's continue to watch that. They want to electrify all their new key models in all in markets in South Korea, USA, China and Europe by 2030. Um, and uh, emerging markets such as India and Brazil are expected to follow by 2035. So they'll make a, a push there. Um, what else? Uh, they also announced that they're going to invest $46 billion in this uh, in R&D by 2025 to help them get there. And um, this also includes the Genesis brand, which will launch its first all-electric vehicle by 2021 before expanding to additional vehicles in the next three years after that. And they're also talking about electric vehicles for the Plan N performance brand. Um, so good to see uh, Hyundai get into that game as well. All right, and uh, to go over to Renault, staying in Europe, Renault has uh, announced that they've passed the 200,000 EV that they've produced since they've started producing all electric vehicles or, and uh, electric vehicles. Uh, the Zoe being the king of that, of over almost 130,000 units. Uh, the Kangoo and some of the other ones make up some of that. And of course, the neat Twizy. If you haven't ri ridden in a Twizy or at least sat in one, you're missing out. So if you get a chance to check those things out, they're pretty cool. Uh, not really practical for our t our winters here in Canada, but if you, as a little runabout in decent weather areas, they're pretty cool. Uh, let's hope that they continue to push forward and to uh, get more product out there. Quick update I received from Polestar that the Polestar 2 um, has now uh, reached the tooling trial prototypes uh, uh, production line. Uh, it's on schedule in the um, Luquo. Luke, uh, whatever, it's, I, I'm going to mess up that name. Uh, it's in China, the factory, uh, before the customer deliveries. Um, this is the uh, second uh, prototype phase called the tooling trial, which is uh, of the road to market, basically, before they get the final production status. And it's designed to uh, prove out the, the vehicle integrity and the process quality and every, all the manufacturing uh, components that go into that to really hone everything down before turning on the production uh, knob and then having vehicles pumped out to be delivered in 2020. Um, they are these these trial prototypes from Polestar on uh, the Polestar 2 are rolling off the, the, the line as we speak. So that's good. And so they're nearing series production. They do uh, anticipate that they're on track for still for customers, first customer deliveries in the first half of next year. So if you have one on order, especially early one, they're still uh, lining up to be able to deliver it when they said they would. So good on Polestar. All right, quick update on Sono Motors. Now, I, I had a few emails actually on this and I've been following them. Of course, I'm on their distribution list. So um, they, they've done some, some changes as far as uh, what they're trying to do as an organization and from a funding perspective. And uh, I actually, um, so I received the emails and if you're on their uh, distribution list, you would have received emails. And if you're checking out their website, you would have seen it. So um, they are, they are 
kind of abandoning the old way of funding. They, they didn't really like the way that that was going. Um, I did reach out to Sono and uh, asking to have a, a, a call with them to actually get more clarity on what all this stuff meant in these announcements. And they were very graciously uh, able to call me back. And we actually had a very good conversation for quite some time outlining their strategy, which I will, which I will talk about to you. So this first uh, this month, what they're doing is a crowdfunding campaign, and they're looking to achieve 50 million euros within 30 days. And this 50 million is basically a pledge. So it's it's either additional reservations or people that have reservations that want to convert them to full orders by paying them all up front. Uh, or a combination of that, and just donations. If somebody wants to just simply make a donation without buying anything. They're looking to take all these pledges in December, and their goal is to get the 50 million euro. And that's a very critical goal for them, because it will actually get them to the next phase of the program, um, which which I will talk about in a sec. But I just wanted to let people know that this 30-day funding that they're doing now, this crowdfunding, is basically a risk-free um, uh, motive because uh, you're just it's really a pledge it, if they hit their 50 million threshold or pass it then they will ask you know then you will then you will be asked to confirm everything by actually paying them and sending them the money in some form or fashion so so that's what this this campaign is to set it up for the next phase um, once they get this 50 million over the next calendar year of t the year 2020, they're going to work on producing a new uh, next series of prototypes um, and offering test drives and just basically refining the prototype to get it close to production. They've taken a lot of input throughout the drives and the test drives and the, and the client feedback that they've got over the last year. Remember, they have over 10,000 reservations currently, deposits um, and interest. Uh, they do have some other financing as well, but you know they didn't want to go down the traditional route because they, they didn't want to give up their intellectual property. They didn't want to give up their goal and their mission statements, which you can easily sell away to VCs if you choose to. Um, they have a plan and they want to stick to that plan. So that's why they come out with this uh, unusual, to a degree, crowdfunding approach. So they want to get those existing prototypes out there. And then um, at that point, after the next year in 2020, then they're going to get to a point, And of course, they're going to take continue to take those funds and invest in the tooling and the manufacturing plant. These vehicles are going to be manufactured in Sweden, of course, in, a, in an ex Saab plant uh, that's out there that'll be pr pr producing these cars for them. So they're going to continue on, you know, molding all that stuff. Um, and then once they uh, once they're done with that and they get all they get it down to uh, a very a pretty well a final prototype situation where they they want to green light that into production, then they have to go to another round of funding. And this is going to be the big ticket funding. They're, they're going to need a, about 200 million more um, to get them to SOP start of production, basically. And you're seeing this graph in this uh, Gantt chart here behind me that gives you timelines that they've uh, that they've talked about. And uh, this will happen in about late 2020, early 2021 time frame where they're going to look at that additional funding. And again, that's going to be a combination of deposits, of reservations paid in full, um, you know, donations, all kinds of things. But it's going to be a big round of funding that they're going to need to get them to hopefully start a production in the first half of 2022. That's their timeline to get there. Um, they want to, they're targeting about 43,000 units per year as, an, as a build um, uh, a, a number of builds that they can do per year for this plant. Of course, within the first year, it's going to take them time to spool up to that number. Uh, I don't have a number of how many vehicles actually could be delivered in 2022, but it's probably a safe bet to maybe assume half of that number. Let's say, you know, definitely they want to fulfill all the reservations and the pre-orders that are already in place today and for the next year or so. So that's their concentrated effort is to is to be able to fulfill those orders in 2022 20, calendar year and then continue on with an eight. Their plan is an eight year run totaling of around 275,000 vehicles or so to get those out into hands, uh, customers hands based on the production models that they have. So that's going to take some time to ramp up, and that's where they—that's where they're going to need that additional 200 million in funding. They are going to continue looking at other funding methods, again, other VCs and other methods. Apparently, it's a different type of process in Germany and in Europe to get funding. It's not as 
the, maybe the term lucrative is not the right one, but it's a little, it's a, a much more challenging um, to find uh, international invest, investors, of course, and something like that. There's a lack of government programs and, and grant processes in Germany, so it makes it hard for startups to get fu financing and funding. And of course, a lot of VCs and a lot of um, uh, funders are in it just for quick profits, and they just want they want this you know, they want to see a quick profit. And again, this is a company that's looking to build up and maintain their mission statement. Uh, I would recommend that you go on their website to check all the information out about what they mean by their mission statement and what they're looking to do from there. Now, the biggest concern that I had was risk to you folks and to consumers that are thinking about it. And those are some of the questions that I focused on. Um, so obviously, existing reservations hold, holders have an opportunity to cancel their reservation uh, and to get a refund on that. And there are T's and C's per each transaction that you can go check out. Um, those deposits are anywhere from 500 euros and upwards. Um, of course, um, in the next round, though, there, there's no guarantees and there is risk. Uh, and like anything, you know, like any crowdfunding or, or any investment strategy there's always a risk element there's no guarantees and I'm not making any promises or guarantees on behalf of Sono Motors either are they so if you want more information I would strongly urge you to go check out their website you can also email their support line at info at sonomotors.com for questions in on your specific case or your specific interests um, but this is their plan the next 30 days or this month of December is critical for them to achieve that. If they don't achieve that target, um, then I don't know what's going to happen, folks. Um, they have to take a hard look at the next plans. Things will change. I don't know what that is. Again, they are looking for other funding means as well, uh, but they're relying on this particular round and the next one's heavily on crowdsourcing and on people you know, uh, looking to purchase the cars. So, if you have a reservation, you know, again, my uh, my advice is if you're not sure what to do, you can reach out to Sono Motors. You can certainly convert it to an order. Uh, hang on to that reservation if you're interested. In Talk to others about it, but definitely check out their website. Contact them directly. I'm not an expert on their business practice, uh, but they were very gracious, as I mentioned, to have a, a long conversation with me about this. They're, they're very motivated. Uh, and to me, you know, they're a very genuine company. I think they're very passionate about what they're trying to do here, and they believe in their business model. They believe in their product that they want to take forward, and to me, that means a lot. So, Best of luck to Sono. I will continue to Sono Motors. I will continue to watch them throughout the month and report back in January to see how they did and what other information we find out. All right, last item here on today's show is just something quick. I just want to have a quick reach out and a thanks to some friends of mine here in Ontario. Um, last month, I was down in Windsor and I was able to get a tour of the Chrysler plant there. It's the plant that makes all the minivans for North America and a good chunk of the world. Uh, I know a lot of them are shipped to China and other global markets. So the chances that you have a minivan from Chrysler from FCA means it's most likely made here in the Windsor, Ontario plant. It's there. It's a minivan only plant and they make uh, three lines. They make one line of the, the, the traditional vans that go back a bit. Then of course they have two lines of the Pacifica uh, or one line I guess but they intermix it with the internal combustion version and the plug-in hybrid version which is uh, plug-in electric which is selling quite well for them. Now this plant actually is uh, is is really big. They've had a lot of expansions over decades, and uh, they can output almost 1,500 vehicles a day. That's a lot. Um, they're averaging currently about 118 to 120 of the plug-in hybrid electric vehicles today, and that's down only because of their they're experiencing the same battery shortage issues that a lot of the other manufacturers are experiencing. They get their batteries from LG Chem uh, uh, organization. There's an outfit in the, the central U.S. that they get their components from for the batteries and they're suffering from there. Now, uh, FCA did tell me that they're going to make an announcement soon on uh, acquiring a secondary source for battery cells for these vehicles and for any future electric plans that they may have. I don't have any intel on that, what that is and what that source is, uh, but that's good to know that they are seriously going after a second supplier and they should announce who that is soon to help them spool it up. But a big thanks, you see some of the pictures, a big thanks to Sean and Pino of the Electric Vehicle Society, the Windsor Essex chapter for for setting this up, for inviting me on this tour, and for hosting it. Uh, it was a great time. I learned a lot. It was really cool to walk the actual production lines, seeing these things being built live. Great to see it. Thank you guys for setting this up. It was certainly an eye-opener and a great education for me. 
All right. Well, that's it for this episode 71 of the EV Revolution show. Thanks for sticking through it and uh, staying with me to listen to the show. Appreciate you watching as I educate minds one tailpipe at a time. Of course, that's my motto here. Um, I want to thank everybody, of course, for their comments and for uh, hanging on on YouTube. Likes, dislikes, whatever. I mean, I always appreciate that. It's good to get good feedback. Again, keep your comments civil, folks. Um, I'm fine if you want to disagree with uh, things that I say. It's okay. We're, it, we agree to disagree. Uh, but let's just keep things civil. Sometimes I have to block the odd one here and there because they get a little nasty and I don't really want that uh, that out there. But I do appreciate you uh, tuning in and uh, sticking and watching that. Now, of course, a big humble thanks to my Patreon supporters. Again, um, you know, you're a big motivator on, on me doing what I'm doing. Uh, so I very much appreciate that. Don't forget Fully Charged Live, uh, February 1st, 2nd, 2020 coming up. Uh, of course, as they're announcing more and more guests and more and more YouTubers and stuff. Uh, I'm going to be, I guess, the small fish in the pond there from a YouTube. Uh, there will be others like uh, Nikki and uh, uh, Now You Know Guys and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and I've met all these, most of these folks out there that are bigger than I am. But, uh, you know, we have very similar goals in, in helping put uh, put uh, bums into electrified car seats is what I like to say, right? Getting in guys into EVs. So that should be a fun show. So if you're going, use my discount code and uh, save yourself 15% off the ticket price. It's always good to have that. And one last thing. So as I mentioned, I will be coming up with an episode uh, focusing on the mass transit soon. I'm just uh, still working on putting that together. Uh, and next episode, I should be announcing uh, I'm going to do another charity event I did last year, some, some sort of fundraiser to get some money for the Sick Kids Foundation is a is a charity that I support here locally in the GTA, the greater Toronto area, very uh, near and dear and passionate to my heart, close to us. Um, so I'm going to be uh, uh, selling a couple things and I'll make an announcement next show on what those are and how I got them and all this kind of stuff in the next show and everything will be going towards charity so stay tuned for that so i believe that i've got everything uh that i needed to say for this show again so thank you very much for watching i appreciate it as always um uh, please continue to subscribe to the show and uh, tell other people about it um you know i'm, I'm slowly again increasing in uh, subscriptions and trying to get the word out there and uh, don't be afraid to email me the contact information is coming up at the end of the show so again until the next show please everybody stay safe and until next time, I'll see you when I see you. Take care. Bye-bye.